This is The Future in Context, episode 100. And now for something completely different. The making of the modern civic hacker, or government is Minecraft to a beginner's mind. I'm Paul Taylor. Dustin Heisler will be here shortly to help put the future of civic hacking in context. Civic hacking is generational. It still carries some of the old school hackathon vibe, but people coming of age today expect to be able to get data, use it for their purposes, add some value along the way, and give it back for the benefit of the wider community. That generational shift offers some interesting possibilities for redefining government digital services and widening the universe of those who make it so. It could also radically change our understanding of what volunteering means when outsiders do more than just run fundraisers. More on that in a moment. Our story has all the makings of a kid in a candy store. The kid in this case is 14-year-old Elias Fretwell. Uh, I'm Elias Fretwell. I like to draw and play piano. A soft-spoken and wicked smart 14-year-old from a town called Lafayette in the East Bay of California. The candy store in this case is made up of the 255,000 data sets posted on the federal open government website, data.gov. Elias had his pick from the quarter million data sets. It really was a cornucopia for a kid who liked games and solving problems. Uh, there's a lot of problem solving, figuring out what the data is, how it can be presented to people, and then using code to put that in a website and make that website look good. So there's a lot of thinking that needs to happen there and then a lot of design stuff. At the risk of pushing the candy store analogy to the breaking point, it didn't take Elias long to figure out that there were more than a few batches that had gone bad. If a government can't publish what they do, it's hard for the general people to see what they're doing and be able to use it and experience it. Um, so a lot of civic hacking builds on what governments do with their data and their work. As the lawyers poked around the federal data repository and its lists, he saw problems. There are a few places where you can find lists of data, but it's not always clear what the data is or how you can use it. So I think they need somewhere where people can go to find data, and if they need it in a specific format, or they need it to be updated, they can easily get to that. Elias persisted, spending time with the posted data sets, finding the relatively few gems in a huge pile of rocks. While government had posted the data sets, it became clear that the government itself hadn't been using them, so it didn't know that there were problems with them. It seems to me a lot of government agencies are putting out their data, but they're not using it, so they don't they don't know if it's good, if it has a problem. There's not a good way to put feedback. Despite the limitations in the available data, Elias began doing for government what it had not done for itself. Elias came to his interest in government and technology honestly. His dad's in the business. Luke Fredwell is founder and CEO of a digital platform designed for local government called Proud City. As was the case with many new ventures and pastimes, the father-son hacking team did its first work during the pandemic. Its first hacks were around the Centers for Disease Control data about state vaccination rates in the early days of COVID. The kernel of it all, says Elias, was that his dad introduced him to APIs. My dad was talking to me about APIs, so then... I went and I looked it up and I figured out how to do it. And then I wanted to like find something that was interesting and build something with it. So this was like in the early COVID days. So I went to the CDC website and looked at, they have vaccine data. So I made a basic like vaccine with all the states and 
the percentage they're vaccinated. And then my dad took it and he made it look good. And that's how he got started with like our public data projects. Now remember, simple math suggests that Elias would have been only 12 years old at the time. Now the project morphed over time into a hoverable map of weekly cases across the United States based on the CDC's National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System, API. We've got links to that project and their other work in the show notes for this episode of TFIC. While the pandemic kept the duo pretty close to home, they found public data from the National Geodetic Survey that became the core of a Survey Mark Finder app. Elias served as lead developer on an app that pinpoints current locations because at root, all data is tied to a place. The Survey Marker app was a milestone for Elias and his dad as coders and at a deeper, more personal level. My favorite is the markers because it's like we can go out and see them and see what the data is. It's a map of survey markers, which are like little reference points for surveyors that they can use when they need to do something in the area. And so the National Geodetic Survey has like their list of ones they have. So, but that's in in a format that's not easy for a computer to read. So I had to make a program to change that. And then I used that new data to make the map. NGS has a map for that, but it's it's kind of hard to use. And if you don't really know what you're doing, you probably wouldn't understand it. So I think ours is easier to get around. With the survey markers, uh, it's really uh, allowed us to kind of engage with one another in a way that I don't like, I, I can't imagine we ever would have, like we spend hours just sort of visiting the Bay area, kind of, um, urban scouting, you know, urban exploring parts of the Bay area that we've never seen before. And, you know, it's just like we spend time in the car talking and we're exploring and we're problem solving when we disagree on when we think we can find the survey marker and, um, uh, and how much time we should spend on finding something that one of us may think is not there. And it's just been really great. It's been an amazing experience. Um, it's been, you know, an opportunity to connect with him in a way that I can't, I never had imagined that I would. His dad helped, but Elias learned how to hack alongside friends at a venerable but sometimes overlooked public institution, the library. The library was offering over the summer, like a scratch camp. So I did that and that's where I started with coding. I can't say enough about the library's role or libraries, plural, in general, their, um, the opportunity for them to create space for kids at an early age to get excited about coding. The nearby Contra Costa Library offered a summer scratch camp based on the MIT developed coding environment for kids. Elias signed up. He organized a coding club with a group of some 20 friends at his middle school, whose members increased their computational thinking by working together at both the school and the library. At the school, I like kind of organized a coding club. It was just a group where kids can get together and code. So everyone, like, you can share your projects or get ideas or get help. At the end of it, kids would demo, like Elias said. So we spent the last 10 minutes and kids would go up and demo. And it was really cool. Parents would come in um, and kids would give up 30 second demo um, and everybody would clap. And it was just a fun kind of experience. Luke did his best to say hands off at the club. Elias was in charge. The rules were if you, there's no gaming, there's no YouTubing. Um, and then if you need help, say, I need help. And then somebody's going to come help you. Um, and if nobody came to help him, it was up to Elias to sort of <laughs> make sure that that person got helped. As for Elias, he wanted more. Moving forward from there, I wanted to make a mod for Minecraft, which is like adding on a feature or something. But I realized that I couldn't do that without knowing how to actually code the game. So I looked up 
where I can learn Java, which is the programming language for it. So I started learning that, and that was like my first introduction to advanced, more advanced coding. Now there is a synergy between the sandbox strategy game Minecraft and the wider world of civic hacking. Both are about harnessing and making use of what those in the respective communities have at hand. And both are renewed by fresh eyes on a problem. You know, it's the beginner's mind, right? Um, there's, in the expert's mind, you know, there are limitations, right? In the beginner's mind, there are none. And, you know, it's just great to see him see kind of the experience of civic hacking through his beginner mind and, um, and sort of building and learning from him, teaching him, but also really like learning from him a lot. Cause you know, if you, if we had a, a hacking competition between the two of us, he'd probably win. The odds are also with the younger civic hacker as the current trends work themselves out. Felt good to like know that I was able to fix a problem and make data more accessible for other people. The way the internet is evolving into much more of a collaborative space and the way that open source movement is becoming more prevalent and more accepted, um, you know, the kids, they're, they're wanting that. They're going to, it's going to be, it's the normal for them. The question is whether the newest normal will scale. Luke feels encouraged. And so really just kind of seeing it through his eyes and coding with him um, and building out, you know, these, these um, projects has really allowed me to kind of rethink how government can deliver digital services in a better way um, and think about kind of data first, API first, in a way that I hadn't really thought about it before. And there is an unequaled thrill when a big, faceless bureaucracy responds to one of his submitted issues, or better yet, acknowledges his contributions. The Elder Farewell believes a reciprocal relationship between public agencies and civic hackers is vital. The first time that he submitted an issue to the um, congress.gov API, they responded back, and it was fairly quickly, um, and closed it out. Uh, and just like he, the the look, like I could see in him, like that's that was pretty cool. Like I did something that, you know, that the Library of Congress acknowledged, and um, and I did that. I helped them fix you know, an API. And, and so I think that like that expectation is there for them. But for me, like those things have helped, you know, rethink, like, how do we build that virtuous civic cycle? How do we create that moment of joy, right? Those micro moments of joy. And it doesn't have to be this like big engagement project or formal engagement project. It can be these, you know, tiny micro movements that help build trans build trust within government in the sense that we're all public servants yeah it's cool to see you can make a difference um and that like you're being heard and that they've like done it they fixed the problem and now you can use that data all of this has reshaped in a fundamental way how the relationship between government and the people it serves should work Members of the public could come alongside public agencies in inventing the next app, finding new uses for public data, and realizing new value for a wider public. Government can be collaborative and be help facilitate creativity, um, but also bring moments of joy. There's opportunities to bring these micro moments of joy beyond just the I voted sticker. Our Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer, Dustin Heisler, has been listening in on all of this. He's also known Luke for a long time, and he has a kid about the same age as Elias. You see big promise in this small story. You know, what's encouraging about Elias is, you know, he's found kind of a hunger to, to be able to plug into things that have real-world impact, and I think we'll see a lot more of that. Now, short of cloning Elias to serve in the government workforce, there is a there there. I think there's also an opportunity for public sector agencies to think about how they go deeper into people like Elias into their age bracket and figure out how do we plug them into work that allows them to give back. 
The net net in all of this is that this generation of civic hackers may fundamentally change our notion of what it means to volunteer. The notion of volunteering needs to be reframed with the new generations. I mean, when you think about how we engage younger demographics traditionally, you know, we have them do fundraisers to raise money for, you know, park dedications and we'll sell water bottles at a, you know, civic event. The new generation, they're hackers. They are civic hackers and they have the ability to do far more than fundraise and sell water bottles and popcorn. We should be plugging them into the apparatus of government and letting them reverse mentor us on new approaches to things, how they're looking at technology. And, you know, I think in the process of doing that, we'll get them excited about, you know, the ability to have a future in the public sector, whether it's a direct career or whether it's just a passion project on the side. So, uh, so that's what excites me about, you know, kind of what Luke and Elias are doing. So we end where we began. For people in Elias's generation and younger, Government is Minecraft to a beginner's mind. And that will do it for episode 100 of TFIC, The Future in Context. Be sure to check out the companion feature on Elias in the summer issue of Government Technology Magazine at govtech.com. Our thanks to Dustin for helping to put civic hacking in context. Our editorial and production team also includes Lauren Kincaid, Noel Nell, Zoe Manzanati, and Kaylee Tedra. Our editor-in-chief is Kathleen Robinette. You can listen and subscribe to TFIC for free on your favorite podcast app. Or stream at any time at govtech.com or governing.com. I'm Paul Taylor. Until next time, thanks for listening.